I'm Dr. Meenakshi Swaminathan, and um, this is the rapid fire diagnostics for exam going postgraduates session. Um, I call the following co instructors on the dais Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, who's going to be speaking on all kinds of fields, Dr. Devendra Venkatramani, going to speak speak on ERG and OCT. Dr. Rajesh, who's going to be speaking on ultrasound and fundus fluorus and angiography. And Dr. Vinay Pillay, who's going to be speaking on corneal topography and ASOCT. And uh, yours truly will be speaking on HESS and diplopia charting at the very end. Just a show of hands, how many here are postgraduates? Wonderful, thank you. It's not that we're going to send you out if you're not, but we're just clarifying. Yeah, I see a, I see a, a, vet, a few veterans in the hall as well. Thank you for joining us. Okay, without much ado, we start off. Uh, so let me say a few things. This is going to be an interactive session, okay? So I've asked for uh, roving mics to be there as well. So if you know the answer, put, on your, put out your hands, put up your hands. So uh, we're going to first talk a few s slides about really how to go about reading a particular diagnostic and then maybe having examples for you to jump in there and answer these, okay? So that's gonna be the format. So let's start off with Dr. Devendra Vekatramani, gonna be talking on ERGs and OCT. 15 minutes. Afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this course and to everybody who's attending. Um, I don't think I can go on for 15 minutes on ERG without half the hall emptying, so I'll try to make it a uh, little topical and a little uh, more exam oriented. So we'll have a little bit of a mix as to uh, what you should know and how you can then interpret the test. So I'll be speaking on ERG and OCT. Let's start off with ERG, and basically, as you, uh, this is something that everybody should know. It's a mass electrical activity from the retina that is measured. So um, the important point is that one may have a small foveal pathology that is missed. With, I mean, in a, in, a, in a sense, you may have a normal ERG. Generally, it, it's um, uh, you know recorded uh, you, with the use of contact lens electrodes. But nowadays, you also have skin strip electrodes that can record the ERG. So clinically, these are the few indications that if you're asked when would you request for an ERG, these are the uh, major indications that uh, one would uh, need an electroretinogram. There are different electrodes. Once again, these are more important from exam purposes that uh, uh, you may be asked a little bit about the electrodes, but uh, there are very, uh, various uh, modifications, in including the use of Zari to record the ERG. Now we'll come on to more practical aspects. So this is a normal ERG waveform. And uh, as you can see, the initial wave is electronegative. So this is, the, uh, this is assumed to be the resting potential. And uh, this, the, the first wave is electronegative. That's called the A wave. After which the wave starts rising, goes beyond the initial point, and becomes an electropositive wave, which is called the B wave. And that comes down. And over a period of time, you may see another positive wave, which is called the C wave. Now, uh, the ERG is basically um, representation of the visual pathways electrical activity. So as you can imagine, the first cell to be stimulated by light would be the photoreceptors. So the A wave is derived from the photoreceptors. And as the signal is then conducted through the visual pathway, it then generates the, the, the other waves. So A wave originates from the photoreceptors. The B wave is uh, produced by the bipolar cells. And over a period of time, as the RPE regenerates the vitamin A, it produces the C wave. So the A and B are therefore the most important two waves in the e normal ERG, or in the ERG's interpretation. There's another uh, series of waves called the oscillatory potentials, which are extracted. Now, these are not very easily visible, but if you amplify the ascending wave 
uh, ascending a limb of the B wave and you really amplify it and magnify it, you will find that there are little oscillations or little uh, wavelets that are called the OPs or oscillatory potentials. And these are thought to be due to the amacrine cells. And they are sensitive for inner retinal ischemia, or they are in, in a sense, they are found to be abnormal in uh, conditions which cause inner retinal ischemia, such as severe diabetic retinopathy and ischemic CRBO. So this is the crux of the test. How do you distinguish rods from cones? And uh, any examination that tests you on basic sciences would require this basic level of knowledge. So rods, as you know, are responsible for scotopic vision or vision that's uh, in dim light, whereas cones function better in bright light. Rods have less temporal modulation. In, in, uh, in other words, they get saturated earlier. So um, if you pre present a stimulus re repeatedly at a frequency of uh, 10 hertz per se uh, 10 hertz, that's 10 times per second, then rods would get saturated, whereas cones take longer to get saturated. Um, not longer. In, in, in a sense, the, they, they, are, they get saturated only at higher frequencies. The peak spectral sensitivity for rods and cones is also slightly different. So using these principles, you can distinguish rods' electrical activities from the electrical activity of cones. This is the ISCEV recommended protocol of how one performs an ERG. Initially, one does 20 minutes of dark adaptation and then records what is called the scotopic ERG, which, is, uh, uh, which encompasses the rod response, the standard com uh, combined response, and the oscillatory potentials derived from that. And after 10 minutes of light adaptation, you do the photopic ERG, which is essentially uh, testing the cone's activity by doing a single flash cone response and the 30 hertz flicker. So this is uh, an image that one should, in a sense, sort of burn into your mind as to how does a normal ERG look. And we talked about all of these tests. So the top three are the scotopic waveforms and the, the bottom two are the photopic waveforms. In the rod response, not having an A wave is normal. Okay, so the scotopic response for rods, it is normal not to have an A wave. There are different theories for that, but the most uh, pre prevalent or uh, widely accepted theory is that if you look at the eye as a three-dimensional globe, for every rod, there is another which is diametrically opposite. So if this rod is giving you a positive signal, this rod will give you a negative signal, and therefore the rod's signals average out and nullify, so there is no A wave in a scotopic rod response. And these are how the other waveforms look. So let's take a few examples. Now on the, you have uh, the right eye here and the left eye here, so if anybody could get up to a mic and see, uh, tell us what they're seeing, uh, it would be lovely, and then we could have a little bit of a discussion. You can raise your hands, and we'll rush the mic to you. Not very difficult. Yeah, please go ahead. Flat ERG. Okay, it's a it's a flat lined or an extinguished ERG. Perfect. So this is just the image that you have to remember how a normal ERG should look like, and you can see that all the top three, which are the scotopic tests, everything is almost flat, and the bottom two, which are the photopic tests again flat. So you have an example of widespread retinal problems which affect both the outer as well as the inner retina. And these are the examples where you would get an extinguished ERG like this. An advanced retinitis pigmentosa, long-standing total retinal detachment, unilateral, but in this case it would be bilateral, LCA, ophthalmic artery occlusion, uh, long-standing siderosis or retinal aplasia. Now we'll move on to another example. Anybody who could uh, volunteer. This is a single eye ERG. As I said, the top three waveforms are the, uh, the scotopic and the bottom two are the photopic. So could anybody tell us what uh, the possible interpretation is? Again, not too difficult. So as we said, the top three or the scotopic ERG uh, is essentially looking at the rods and the bottom two is looking at the cones. So now having given you this massive clue, can uh, someone volunteer? So, so this uh, patient has uh, came with a history of um, poor vision since since birth, has nystagmus, and visual field shows a central scotoma. Vision is six by sixty in both eyes, and has obviously very poor color vision. So this is a, a, an example of, yes, a cone patholo uh, a pathology affecting cones more. So uh, this could be a cone dystrophy. That would be your first interpretation. And uh, sorry, I went back. And uh, these are the other uh, features of a cone dystrophy. 
that could tell you why you're dealing. So you have a, an abnormal uh, photopic ERG and a normal scotopic ERG. So it tells you that there is a cone problem. A la uh, one last example. You have two. The, the one on the right is the right eye. The one on the left is the left eye. So how would you interpret? So as I said, the, this is the scotopic ERG. This is the photopic part. So how, and that's the normal one. So what, where do you think the abnormality lies? We still have OCT to go, so we'll rush through a quick answer from anybody. Okay, so this ERG is, abs uh, is obviously abnormal. Here you can see that uh, the B wave is extremely low, if at all. And over here also, the maximum combined response is also abnormal. It's blunted with a uh, blunted B wave. So this tells us that there is a problem with the B wave aspect of it. And as I said, the B wave is ori originates from the bipolar cells. You're getting an A wave over here, uh, which tells us that the photoreceptors are normal. So in, in, a, in this condition, you have normal outer retina, which is where the photoreceptors and RPE lies, and an abnormal inner retina, which is where the conducting part of the retina lies, those bipolar cells. So this is a typical waveform seen in ischemic CRVO, and you must remember this because even when you answer a question on CRVO, uh, this is one of the methods of uh, different distinguishing an ischemic versus a non-ischemic CRVO. And um, the other condition obviously could be an advanced diabetic retinopathy. So these are conditions where you get an abnormal B wave, but the initial response from the photoreceptors is normal. Okay, I, I won't go to, too much into pattern ERG, but it does provide a distinguishing role between retinal and optic uh, problems and optic neuropathies. And multifocal ERG from the exam purpose, probably identification, and it's uh, obviously, uh, its uh, main use is chloroquine toxicity and a paracentral or parafoveal para, uh, scotoma. We'll skip VEP, we'll directly jump to OCT, which is probably very important nowadays. And um, it's nice to know a little Greek and Latin. I always tell my residents that medicine is nothing but Greek and Latin, but you, you must know a little bit about it. So opticos means light, coherence means that the waves are in phase, and tomography is divided. If you divide tomography, tomos means to cut. Atom comes from indivisible. It cannot cut. So the Greeks thought that atom was the smallest indivisible particle of matter, though we know that they are wrong now. And graphy is to have a pictorial depiction of the same. So here you have the optical principle, which is based on Michelson's interferometry. When light is incident on a particular structure, some part of it is transmitted through and some part gets reflected. And this keeps going on through all the retinal layers where some part is transmitted or absorbed and some part gets reflected. And when you compare the phase difference between the emergent light and the incident light that had been shown into the eye, you get uh, an interference pattern, and that interference pattern is then, is then depicted in the form of a two-dimensional um, uh, picture, which is the OCT. So looking at the ret retinal OCT, what is important to know are the various layers which um, spectral domain OCT can now show you. Starting from the internal limiting membrane, RNFL, the two of them are generally not distinguishable, and going right up to the RPE, that's where the retina ends, but beyond that also can be imaged with an OCT. You can find, you can see the various layers of the choroid and even into and beyond the sclera. So when you are provided an OCT in the examination, you need to go in a methodical manner as to how to describe it, starting from the vitreo retinal interface, the foveal contour, the retinal architecture in terms of how the layers are, whether there's any intraretinal uh, pathology whether there's any subretinal pathology and whether there's any sub RPE pathology. So we'll quickly jump through some examples. We'll have, a, you know, this is going to be a true rapid fire. If anybody can shout out what they think is abnormal, that should be fine. You don't need to wait for the mic. Okay, so as you can see, starting from the vitreo retinal interface, you can see that there's some abnormal hyperreflective linear membrane like layer lying on top of the retina, throwing the retina into folds or corrugations. And that tells us that there is probably an epiretinal membrane overlying the retinal surface. So that's how you would describe an OCT in terms of the correct terminology, hyperreflective, or um, uh, these are the words that you would use because it's light-based. Anybody over here? So essentially, this is a pseudo-hole because here there is an epiretinal membrane that's bunching the fovea into uh, a small uh, space, and that's producing a pseudo-hole-like appearance. Over here. 
So yeah, this is, would be a vitreophobial traction, okay? Or uh, yes, a vitreomacular traction would of course be acceptable. And here you can also see incomplete PVD. This is where the optic disc would be. And the, the vitreous or the posterior hyaloid is attached to the optic disc as well as to the fovea. Over here. So you see incomplete, uh, you see uh, incomplete PVD because there is an optic disc attachment of the vitreous over here. There is a complete or a full thickness macular hole with elevated edges and cystoid spaces in the edges of the macula, uh, in the edges of the macular hole. What about this? So this would be an example of cystoid macular edema. What about this? So if you go methodically, the vitreo retinal interface is normal, but you see that the fovea is pushed up and there are, within the retina, there are cystoid spaces. There are these hyperreflective dots, which are likely to be hard exudates. And there is subretinal fluid or neurosensory detachment. So this is the methodical way of describing the OCT. And this condition is generally a cystoid macular edema with excessive exudation, which is why you get a neurosensory detachment also. What about this? So without going to the diagnosis first, if you look at the, no, uh, the normal vitreo retinal interface, a normal foveal contour, but the entire retina is detached in the foveal region. That's a neurosensory or a foveal, a foveal detachment. And this tells us that this is some form of um, leakage or breakdown of the outer blood retinal barrier, which lies at the level of the RPE. And this is going to be likely to be central serous chorioretinopathy or CSCR. Okay, now what about this? Yes, so here you can see that the RPE is detached. And so the, this fluid filled space that we are seeing is not under the neurosensory retina, it's actually under the RPE. It's a dome shaped elevation which, which has, uh, it's very dark inside, telling us that it's likely to be clear liquid. So it's a serous PED, unlike a hemorrhagic PED which would have, which would be gray within it, or a drusenoid PED which would be small and gray. And what about this? Here you have a neurosensory de detachment along with an RPE detachment. Over here, you see this mushroom-like structure that seems to be originating from the RPE or below it and sort of uh, spreading underneath the retina. And this is called a type 1 CNVM, or a class, which would likely to be a uh, classic CNVM if you do an FFA. I, I don't know if I have time for this, but on pass OCT uh, is just the basis for what you may be asked, which is OCT angiography. And OCT angiography is something I would strongly suggest people start reading up because although it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not all that widespread, I think it's an it's important investigation of the future, so you need to know a lot about it. Okay, thank you and all the best. Thank you, David, Dr. Devendra. I know it's tough to do ERG and uh, OCT uh, in 15 minutes. It was allotted, but wonderful. And uh, great students here, great residents here. Yeah, let's keep the momentum up. So um, that was Dr. Devendra, vitreoretinal surgeon from uh, Lakshmi Eye Institute, Panvel. And next we have Dr. Rajesh. Uh, he's a medical retina and cataract uh, specialist from uh, Shankar Netralia, uh, a passionate teacher. And he's going to be covering ultrasound and FFA. Good morning all. Thank you, Madam. We start with the contest fluorescent angiography. It uh, works in the principle of fluorescence by the sodium fluorescent and 5 ml of 25% sodium fluorescent is injected. And this has high rate of anaphylaxis. So we should be careful during the procedure. And as it is done with the light off in a dark room, during the process of the procedure, we should be alert to find out any of the allergy anaphylaxis. Otherwise, we can lose the patient. So all the facilities for resuscitation should be available, and the personnel who are doing it uh, should be able to handle the procedure uh, in case needed. And there is an excitation filter and a barrier filter. Coming to the phase of angiogram, First is the toroidal space or pre arterial space with the flush, uh, which happens 10 to 12 seconds after the injection of the dye, followed by arterial space and the venous space with the lamina airflow and the complete venous filling and the recirculation phase. From here, the intensity of the fluorescence starts decreasing. Coming to the recirculation phase, 
the dye is gradually eliminated from the eye. And the timing is important. Anything more than 30 seconds in arm to choroid is abnormal, and anything more than five seconds in the arterial phase is delayed, and the arterial venous transit more than 15 seconds is abnormal. Autofluorescence can be emitted by certain structures in the eye, like optic nerve drusen and uh, hamartoma, and uh, the pre-injection photograph can show the, and fluorescence can happen due to the mismatch of filters. Abnormal fluorescence can be either hypofluorescence or hyperfluorescence. The hyperfluorescence can be blocked fluorescence from a preretinal source of a preretinal heme or subretinal heme, or a filling defect from a major artery occlusion or patchy filling defect in various conditions. Hyperfluorescence can be window defect, which will start in the early phase, and gradually it will decrease in intensity, but the size will remain same throughout the angiograph. And pooling will start in the early phase and increase in intensity, but the size remains same. And leakage will increase in intensity as well as the size as the phases of angiogram progresses. And staining happens at the late phase. And here we can see the transmission defect uh, through the RPE, the staining of the sclera. Coming to TNVM and its uh, the parafoveal capillary branch network of hyperfluorescence hyper starts early in the uh, angiogram, which keeps increasing in intensity and leaks at the late phase. If there is a large PED with irregular filling, you should suspect of an occult TNVM, which has to be confirmed with an OCT or an ICG. We are not talking about ICG, which was not included in the topic. In central serous choreopathy, there can be leaks in, in blots or smokestack, which progressively increase in, in size and intensity throughout the angiogram. And there is an RPE track of transmission defect, uh, which will keep decreasing in intensity as the phase of angiogram progress. The diabetes is a common disease. It can present with maculopathy or proliferative retinopathy. The focal maculopathy is characterized by leaking microaneurysm starting in early phase. And by angiogram, we can identify the leaking microaneurysm, which will need treatment. And uh, focal laser is uh, needed to treat this. And, or it can be a diffuse leak due to the leak from the parafoveal capillary bed or a cystoid, hepaloid pattern. And when there is a loss of perifoveal capillary network, it will be an ischemic maculopathy. We can see the uh, loss of perifoveal capillary network. And in proliferative retinopathy, it can be an NVE or NVD, which progressively increase in size and intensity of leak. You can see the asymmetry of section of the retinopathy in the right and left eye. So I say there is an early NVE, whereas left eye is advanced diabetic disease. In CRVO, there is dilatation and toxicity of veins with delayed AV transit time, which is about 34 seconds. And in late phase, there is staining of the vessel wall and this staining. This is a non-ischemic CRVO. And there is a cystoid macular edema in a honeycomb pattern. And ischemic CRVO, there is a capillary non-perfusion, all the quadrants with the loss of perifoveal capillary network. And the tributary vein occlusion, which is uh, not affecting the macula, there is a blockage of the fluorescence. And the ischemic branch retinal vein occlusion, whereas the infra temporal vein is occluded with the 
capillary non-protrusion and appearance of NVE. And so there's a profuse leak from the NVE. Retinal macroaneurysms are not very common, but uh, it can happen in uh, ladies of four third to fourth decade, and which happens in the first to third order vessel, and which causes leak from the early phase of the angiogram, and progressively increasing in size and intensity. So while reporting an FFA, we need to see first the fundus photograph, identify the eye, and note the arm retinal circulation time, whether there is any delay in that, and note the AV transit time, and identify the phase of angiogram, and identify the type of abnormality, whether it's a hypofluorescence and hyperfluorescence, and we need to go through the early, intermediate, and late stage of the angiogram to know the type of abnormality. Coming to ultrasound, it works with the principle of piezoelectric crystal in a transducer which emits the sound wave at 8 megahertz, which is usually used in ultrasound. We use 20 megahertz from UBM. And there's a transducer amplifier and a display monitor. And if the sound wave is uh, falling on the structure perpendicularly, the returning echoes are stronger. And the gain is measured in decibels. And by increasing or decreasing the gain, it decreases the increase of the amplitude or brightness of the echoes. And uh, the time gain compensation enhances the echoes from the deeper structure by inhibiting the echoes from the superficial structure. So that gives the better quality of the uh, structure which we image. And it can be an A scan, which is a one dimensional amplitude modulated, or a two dimensional B scan displayed in the monitor. So the probe position can be either transverse, longitudinal, or axial. The transverse will measure the lateral extent of the lesion, longitudinal measure the antero posterior extent of the lesion. The axial a scan, B scan gives the, the lesion in relation to the lens as well as the optic nerve head. And we need to take all these uh, scans, longitudinal, axial, and transverse, uh, both in the high and low gain. And uh, we need to measure, identify the location, extent, and size. And we need to uh, know the movement vascularity and convention pattern of the lesion. In a normal B scan, the in young age the lens is echolucent, but as the age progresses, the, once the cataract happens, the, there is change in intensity of the lens. And vitreous in normal probably in young age is echolucent. Retina choroid and uh, uh, sclera is highly reflective and optic nerve is wedge shaped acoustic void in the retrobal bar region. So coming to PVD, this is a membranous echo. We are dealing with either a dot echo, membranous echo, or a solid lesion, or a cystic lesion. So in uh, PVD, it's a membranous echo, which can be complete or incomplete PVD, which uh, is appearing in the low gain, uh, disappears in low gain and then it's linear and with an undulating movement. And vitreous hemorrhage is characterized by multiple dot-like echoes throughout the vitreous cavity. It can be either an acute or a fresh vitreous hemorrhage or a long-standing vitreous hemorrhage. And in long-standing vitreous hemorrhage, it is more of a clumps and pseudo membranes and which is gravity dependent. And the differential diagnosis of this is a astroid hyalosis, which is more reflective, discrete echoes, and with a definite gap between the posterior surface of this lesion and the anterior surface of the retina. And sometimes this astroid hyalosis is associated with 
the sub hyaloid theme which will show the low to moderate reflective echoes and another differential diagnosis is endophthalmitis there is a comparison between the normal eye and an endophthalmic eye there is a membranous lesion and moderate reflective echoes and there is thickening of the retina and the choroid and the sclera and it may be associated with the other signs of retinal detachment and choroidal detachment sometimes they can be an intraocular foreign body or a trough lens material so retinal detachment is a high reflective membrane which with an attachment to the optic nerve with the movement and it can be a complete or a partial detachment and long standing retinal detachment can have cyst formation with a decreased mobility so it can be a closed funnel or an open funnel retinal detachment and the exudative rd as the fluid dependent and it has a changing configuration and usually appears as a convex lesion in supine position and it disappears on sitting position due to the shifting fluid and the causes can be varied from inflammation to tumor mass or granuloma fractional retinal detachment will have attachment to optic nerve which may be point attachment or a broad base attachment sometimes the choroidal detachment may be associated with the retinal detachment choroidal detachment usually is a hyper reflective double spike m spike lesion from the retina as well as the choroid and it may be a serous choroidal detachment or a hemorrhagic if it is hemorrhagic there will be low reflective echoes behind that you can see both the echoes of the retinal detachment as well as the choroidal detachment and you can see here the retinal detachment and the pvd in a acute rd and this in a long standing rd the movement of the retina is very limited whereas in a fresh rd it is freely mobile and few conditions of retinal choroidal elevation like pcv and uh, macular edema cnvm tuberculoma or tumors can see the with him near the retinal choroidal elevation which is moving with a low intensity echoes and coming to solid lesions we have uh, retinoblastoma which is of two types exophytic and endophytic uh, and uh, endophytic which grows into the vitreous cavity which is high reflective and with the vitreous sheathing and with multiple high reflective echoes due to the calcium or a endophytic tumor and in the exophytic there is a exudative retinal detachment and a subretinal mass and choroidal melanoma it's a solid lesion and with a high surface reflectivity with a mild to moderate internal reflectivity and there is an acoustic hollowing behind that and there is an angle of kappa angle of kappa is when we draw a line from the maximum spike of the a scan and the succeeding spike it is steep and this shows there is decrease in intensity of the sound which is traveling there is a mass lesion which is characteristic of malignant melanoma so angle kappa acoustic hollowing and a solid tumor with a high surface reflectivity with a mild to moderate internal reflectivity is diagnostic of choroidal melanoma with a choroidal excavation you can see the choroid here well but it is obliterated due to the mass lesion and posterior scleritis and there is thickening of the choroid as well as sclera and subtenant space is expanded this is a t sign 
and the intraocular foreign body you can see there is a high reflectivity of a metallic foreign body in these two so ultrasound is one of the most important non invasive diagnostic method which needs very minimal patient cooperation and the echogenic characteristics are diagnostic of the disease and correlation with the history and clinical examination is most important thank you Thank you, uh, Rajesh. Again, very tough to club two topics in 15 minutes, uh, and I think you did uh, justice. I saw a lot of people taking notes. This is how people take notes these days. Anyway, no, no kidding. We're happy that you're taking notes because each and every one of these topics are going to be asked in the exam viva. Next, we have an even greater challenge for Rashmin Gandhi to to complete in 15 minutes both neuroophthalmology and glaucoma fields. So, how do you approach uh, fields in the exam? Dr. Nishmin Gandhi, again, a very passionate teacher, the director of the Foresight Worldwide, and uh, you know, opening up opportunities for young ophthalmologists worldwide. So, over to Nishmin Gandhi. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ames, for including me with in a very nicely crafted uh, program. So, uh, actually, what happens when you're given a visual fields in your exam? You don't know whether it's glaucomatous visual field or a neurological visual field. So, what we are going to do is to go through the steps uh, in your exam which are partly shortcuts to see how would you read fields if the fields are given to you there will be some information as which would be useful for your clinical practice but this is more towards your exam in the practical exam the fields are given to you what would you do and let's walk through it so these are the things that you will quickly look at when you are given a visual fields first and foremost is whatever printout which has been given to you is it reliable so quickly look at the reliability index and see whether whether patient has higher false positive or false negative the second thing if both visual fields are given to you then uh, answer the question whether the visual field defects are there in one eye or both the eyes then the third part would you uh, say that the visual field defect is because of an ocular pathology or because of the visual pathway then whether the defect is predominantly nasal predominantly temporal i would add one more point saying is it more towards center or is it more towards periphery is it respecting any of the vertical or the horizontal midline so these are the things that you'll quickly look at if the printout is given to you and then try to read the fields because most of the time examiner may not have told you whether a printout which has been given to you is a history you may not have a history all right so with this let's look at some examples now let's assume that reliability criteria this this field is reliable so first thing first unilateral or bilateral it's bilateral right now is it nasal or temporal i said that nasal or temporal center versus periphery these are the two things that you need to quickly look at in a gray scale right and then you go on to mean deviation pattern standard deviation to say whether whatever you're looking at is Uh, is making any sense so in a gray scale uh, what is this this is nasal or temporal this is nasal all right how many of you think this is a bi nasal defect can you raise your hands okay so rest of you think why did you think that is nasal how do you differentiate between a nasal and a temporal halves in a visual field blind spot right blind spot is nasal or temporal blind spot blind spot is because of what temporal. optic disc so optic disc is nasal or temporal nasal. in the in the eye optic disc is nasal so conversely the visual in the visual field blind spot would be temporal can you see blind spot here blind spot is hidden by the visual field defect all right so that's how you say this is a bi temporal defect so if you are not told which eye Uh, the visual field belongs to first thing you look at is where is the blind spot so blind spot would be temporal that's how you'll know which side of the visual field you are dealing with the other important part is that if both the visual fields are given to you please make sure that the right visual field would be on your right 
and the left visual field would be on your left. There are instances where the examiner would interchange it and give it to you. It's your duty to make sure that the right visual field is on your right, left on your left. Okay? So here, this is a bitemporal hemianopia. Right? There is a complete loss of a temporal visual field. So if it's a bitemporal hemianopia, would you associate that defect more with glaucoma or with neurological problem? Neurological problem. So if you say that this defect looks like neurological, then the second point always is where in the visual pathway you'll find this defect. So where would you localize the lesion? Optic chiasm, right? Bitemporal hemianopia is where you'll find uh, where uh, the localization, the lesion would be at the optic chiasm. What are the other features? So that's how the viva would go. The bitemporal hemianopia would be the starting point. So now the, the second question can be, you might be given an MRI, and you would say, oh, okay, this is an axial scan, T1 weighted image, and you find a pituitary tumor there. Or you might be asked as to what are the other neuroophthalmic features? What else would you look for, or what else would you find if you examine this patient? What would you find in the fundus? Patient with bitemporal hemianopia like this, where the temporal visual fields are wiped out, what would you find in the fundus? Maybe Mike or shout it out. The pallor, disc, pallor. disc pallor. Is there a specific type of disc pallor that you will find? Because this is temporal visual field which is gone. So what it means is the nasal fibers are gone. They are atrophic. Nasal to macula. So nasal fibers to macula are actually inserted in the disc in a horizontal raphe. The superior and inferior are arcuate fibers, superior pole and inferior pole. So there will be a bow tie optic atrophy or a band-shaped optic atrophy. So that's the other feature. The other feature would be seesaw nystagmus. So if you're given these fields, first right on your right, left on your left, you have a, a, a you, you know that this is a bitemporal defect, respecting a vertical midline, localizing lesion to optic chiasm, other features can be bowtie optic atrophy or seesaw nystagmus. So this is a MRI, okay. Let's read at this field. So again, right on your right, left on your left. Let's first look at the left eye visual field. This is the left eye visual field. Anybody would like to venture a guess? Just assume that uh, it's a reliable field because that's the first thing you look at. So it's a reliable field. Predominantly defect is where? Nasal or temporal? This defect is the most impressive defect here. So where is the predominant defect? Nasal or temporal? Temporal. temporal because you, you see a blind spot here. Blind spot is always temporal. So a predominant defect in the temporal visual field. Is it respecting a vertical midline? A sort of. You know, in, in, in the real life, it may not be as clear cut as what you saw in the, in the first picture. So it, it, you can say that the predominant impressive visual field defect is respecting a vertical midline with a little bit of spillover. So that's about the left eye. Suprotemporal visual field defect, which is respecting a vertical midline. What about this eye? This is the right eye. What do you see here? Is black or white? Is the printout appearing black or white? Grayscale. Black. Excellent. So what is this now? So when you see this kind of complete obliteration of visual field, in most instances, it would have originated from the optic nerve. Please remember, optic nerve pathologies can cause following visual field effects. The most common would be arcuate scotoma or nasal step. That would be seen in nasal step or an arcuate scotoma are the visual field effects of which problem? Glaucoma, and which is a optic neuropathy where intraocular pressure is one of the risk factors. So optic nerve pathologies can have following visual field effect. Arcuate scotoma or nasal step, which are commonest. Central scotoma, centrocecal scotoma, enlargement of blind spot. Where would you see enlargement of blind spot? Papula edema, right? And in a severe problem, patient can have this kind of complete wipeout of field or generalized reduction of sensitivity. 
or tutorial defects. So these are the defects which would originate if there is a pathology in the optic nerve. Now you know that this is originated from the optic nerve on the right side, and there is a severe problem of the right optic nerve. So what do you have learned from the field? Severe problem of the right optic nerve, advanced visual field defect on the right side, and a supratemporal defect of the left side. Would you say, is this glaucoma or is this neurological? This, mind you, can be glaucoma. In a very advanced glaucoma, you can have a complete black field, right? But please remember, the center is affected last in glaucoma. You'll generally have a peripheral defect, which will keep constricting. Patient can still have 6-9 vision, but a very small island of vision. So this can be glaucoma. What about here? Predominantly temporal defect generally would be neurological. Glaucometer's visual field defect would start from here and then would break up here or here. All right, so it'll start from the opposite side of a blind spot and would go up and down, causing a superior or inferior arcade scotoma. So here, if it's a predominantly temporal defect, you know this is again a sign of a neurological problem. Optic nerve, one side, supratemporal defect on the other side. This is an example of a junctional scotoma. Again, a feature which would you see in a chiasmal compression or a chiasmal disease. So this, I want you to remember again, if there is a chiasmal compression, if a predominant defect is superior, you know that the problem is coming from below the optic chiasm, a pituitary gland problem. If the visual field defect, which is predominantly temporal and is starting from inferior visual field, you know that the chiasma is getting compressed from above. The example would be craniopharyngioma. Another example of, again, a junctional scotoma. See, the left eye optic nerve is completely gone. Right eye, this is a supratemporal defect. This is a blind spot a supratemporal defect. These are the causes of chiasmal compression where you'll find either a junctional scotoma or a bitemporal hemianopia. The reason I spend a lot of time here is that this is the commonest visual field defect in neurology that you'll get, number one. And number two, this is the commonest misdiagnosis of NTG is pituitary tumor. So people who have been treated as normal tension glaucoma after six or eight months, you realize that, oh, it's not matching the clinical picture. You do MRI, and you find that patient has actually a pituitary tumor. So you have to remember that predominant temporal visual field effect, you're probably looking at a neurological problem. What about here? Respecting a vertical midline? Yes. Now here you can see the blind spots. So this is by nasal hemianopia. Generally comes from the eye. Binasal hemianopia, though it is, it is a hemianopia, but 75% of these patients would have some eye problem as mentioned here. What do you think is happening here? Which eye is this? Right or left eye? Right eye, very good. Visual field effect, respecting a midline, horizontal midline, yes. Is there a predominance of a problem? You can say yes. More, more uh, dense on the nasal side, but it's equally there on the temporal side. So if you ignore this, then you can say this is a dense inferior arcuate scotoma. The point against it would be that it is approaching a center, which is uh, rare in glaucoma. In glaucoma, it would have gone like this, okay? So here it is going to the center. There is a spillover, a, a dense spillover to the temporal side, and then you have a disc picture where you can correlate the two and tell me the diagnosis? What do you think you're dealing with? AION, and this field effect is called? Altitudinal visual field effect. Absolutely right. So this is a blind spot, right eye, temporal side, nasal side. This is now a predominant nasal visual field effect, isn't it, on a gray scale? It is affecting the center but it has started from here. So you can say maybe it's a dense superior arcuate scotoma, but please remember, visual field effect can also be produced by the presence of a retinal problem. What do you think is happening here? Right on your right, left on your left, this is a blind spot. 
is the defect uh, respecting a vertical midline? This is the main defect on a grayscale. It is respecting a vertical midline, isn't it? Is it superior or inferior? Superior or inferior? Superior or inferior? F the most impressive visual field effect is superior or inferior? Nasal. So this is the most impressive visual field effect. This is a nasal quadrant. This is a temporal quadrant. So what do you think is happening here? And they look alike. They're looking similar. So this is homonymous hemianopia because it's, it's on one side. Which side? Left side. It's on your left. So left homonymous hemianopia, but it's more only in the inferior quadrant. So patient has left inferior quadrant anopia. Where would you localize the lesion? Because it's respecting a vertical midline, it's a neurological problem. Where would you localize the lesion? This is what is classically described as pi in the floor, and you localize it to parieto occipital uh, region of the brain. Okay? This is versus pi in the sky, where you localize it to temporal visual field. What is this? And I'll end with this. What is this? Normal visual fields? So this is, generally blind spot would be like this. You can see a little line here. So the blind spot has become bigger than, this is how enlarged blind spot will look like. And as somebody mentioned, it's seen in a bitemporal hemianopia. So let me conclude saying, examine both fields together when you're given the visual fields. Make sure that the right visual field is on the right side and left is on the left side. I cannot reemphasize it more. First, do look at grayscale. Everybody will tell you that grayscale is not important, but grayscale will give you the pattern. And that's the reason why I'm just, uh, I restricted myself to grayscale. It'll give you a pattern where you say whether it's temporal or nasal, central or peripheral. And then you look at the deviation to see whether whatever you're seeing is really relevant. Whether it's monocular or binocular. And this is what I said. Remember, this is how the optic neuropathologies, these are the visual field defects that you'll find in an optic neuropathology. I again thank Dr. MS for this opportunity. Thank you, Rashmin, um, for uh, doing justice. I think you've uh, um, sufficiently getting them ready for the exam. So uh, the exam, uh, often you will have uh, ant anterior segment examiners, and they love to ask questions about corneal diagnostics. So coming up next is Dr. Vinay Pillay from uh, Giridhar Eye Institute. He's a senior cornea consultant, Shankar Netralia alumnus, also worked in LV Prasad, and he's going to give you an overview of corneal diagnostics. Thank you, madam. Thanks for including me in this. So. Uh, uh, most of you might get a print like this when you are in the exams ask why were asking so what does what does this you know uh, mean and how are you going to interpret this so this is what you should do first okay try to identify you know which machine if possible and of course uh, when you're in clinic it is important to check that the patient in front of you is the same as the you know what uh, print you are looking at so why sh is it important to identify the machine? Uh, because each machine uses different technology to assess the surface. I mean, topography is, what, what is topography? What does topography mean? It is assessing the irregularity on the surface, okay. So most common, uh, you know, uh, technique used is the Placido system and one of the oldest technique and the shame flag. These are the commonest technique used or available machine or the machines that use now. And these are some of the machines. Uh, uh, that uh, that is being used now. Uh, Obscan is practically out now. Uh, Pentacam or Oculizer is the most common pro with uh, no, others coming below those. So, so coming back to the print, what strikes you most in this? Very colorful, right? What does the color stand for? It's very simple when you're starting 
Look at the colors. If it is red or red shaped, it's a danger sign. Okay, it shows stop. Relook at this. Okay, this is not like a you know routine thing. Relook at that. It means in the curvature map, the red means it is steeper. Next is always the quality. Some of the machines like Pentacam Oculizer has got a, a you know reliable factor or quality uh, scale given. You don't have to actually really know what it means, but then uh, in Pentacam it is very easy. It is color coded. If it is red like this, it means the quality is poor. And look at the picture. It's so bizarre, right? So, and the same patient, you know, look at the quality, when the quality of the image is good. It's very smooth. So that is the next step to do. Look at the quality. Then third step, you start reading the map. What are the, uh, you know, maps given here? It's sagittal, that is the curvature, and that is what actually the Placido mach this machine gives. It gives only this. These are the elevation and packy. We'll come to that later. But what does uh, sagittal curvature mean? Any idea? It's actually the curvature. OK, what it does is in Placido, it uh, projects rings onto the surface and measures. In shape flag, it takes, it takes from the slit images. OK. So different uh, you know, um, uh, curvature maps. Axial or standard or sagittal is used for screening, and tangential or in instantaneous is used for to get out or to pick the finer uh, changes. So this is how basically all you have to understand is sagittal map smoothens out, and tangential map gives the local changes. And this is how it looks. The same picture in two different uh, you know, uh, ways of representation, axial and uh, instantaneous or tangential. See how smooth it is and see how irregular it is. So this is the sagittal or axial is good for screening. And uh, this is obviously a keratoconus uh, uh, picture. See, it looks like a huge, you know, steep cornea. But then when you take the instantaneous, it shows a very localized steepening, which actually corresponds to the rest. You know, these are the areas where it is actually conical. So that is the importance of looking at what type of map is there. So the curvature, look at the curvature, then the elevation. This is the second most important thing, the topography or the tomography, as what we call now assesses. It is the elevation map or the height. It assesses what high, how high the point of interest is from a uh, uh, reference level is. You have elevation map for the anterior surface and the elevation map for the posterior surface, and this is what it means. This is the cornea, and these are the, uh, you know, surfaces. And this is how, you know, epicurial representation. But then generally what you have to understand is you have the cornea, and then there is a uh, best fit sphere or a surface which a computer calculates for that. What it means is it calculates a sphere or a circle which, is, which has got a maximum area of contact with the surface. And the rest from this sphere, is it above or below? If it is above the surface, it is given in redder colors. And if it is below the surface, it is given in cooler colors. OK, that is, that is all it means. And this is a normal one. If you can see, this green is where the sphere touches the cornea surface. This is the anterior surface, and this is the posterior surface of the cornea. And this is the normal one. While any idea what this means? Can somebody say what it means? This is actually an abnormal elevation. Why is it abnormal? Because if you can see, it is more evident in the posterior. If you can see, there is a localized red circle. It means an isolated island. Very, very, very suspicious, or even diagnostic of early keratoconus, OK, or ecteric diseases, OK? This island is the most important sign in detecting early keratoconus. It can be very evident, as in this one, or it, it will be very subtle. If you see, it looks normal. But then if you go into this, you can see there's a small round area here, and then it is 22. That means it is 22 microns above the reference surface. But then if you come out here, what is it? 14, 14, 18, which means it is below that. So there is an island there also. And these two, it's the same patient. If you can see, these two actually corresponds at the apex of both the you know, elevation. So it means the cornea is like this there, danger sign. So next, most important thing is look at the scale. How is the values represented based on or in relation to the color? Height, curvature, power. Let's see. What is the absolute scale? It means 
one color always means one power. For example, red might mean 52 in all, uh, you know, in all printouts. While in normalized scale, it is slightly different. What it means is each machine will have a definite number of colors for the, uh, representing the curvature. Suppose if it is 11 colors, okay. My cornea, uh, the keratometry range might be from 40 to 44, while in another one it might be from 39 to 40. This 11 colors is given to this 11 or this range. So the red in mine, which means 44, may not be the red in the other one, which is 40, steepest. So it is not a good thing or a not a good scale for comparing different pictures. Look at this. What is the scale? Absolute. Look at that, sir. Normalized scale. See the red? 44. Coming to the previous one, where is the red? 50. OK, so that is the difference. It can you know, mislead you. So always look at the scale. Now, this is a, another uh, you know, picture of keratoconus. This is, again, look at the scale. This is the absolute scale. And look at it. OK. If you, if you are given these two, you will feel this is a very steep cone. But look at this. What? This is white, I mean, nearing white, which is somewhere around 50, 52. What is the white there? It's 90. So this is the difference between the, uh, or the importance of scale. Look at the scale. Next is adjustable scale. I mean, you can give whatever value you want to for one particular level. I have never used this. I don't know why it is still there in the machine. Now, once you have, you know, all these steps in, next comes reading the map. How do you read the map? It is pattern recognition. So sagittal curvature or the curvature maps, what are the, you know, normal curvature pattern? Commonest is asymmetric bow tie, round, oval, symmetric, irregular. You know all what these are. So this is, this is a TMS printout, which is a placido based system. This is a round. This is an oval pattern. This is, anybody? Quick. What is it? Symmetric bow tie or dumbbell, asymmetric. This is an inferior steepening. This is a superior steepening. And done. now this is a very irregular astigmatism. Can you see all over the colors here? See, same here. Different colors in, you know, in the central three millimeter. That means irregular astigmatism. Most commonly you see them after trauma or post graft and things like that. Now, this is an interesting concept. This is actually the name comes from chemistry, biochemistry, enantiomorphism, which means one is a mirror image of the other. Look at these corneas, right and left of the same patient. If you keep in a mirror, this is what you get. Another picture, the same. Okay, enantiomorphism indicates a normal cornea. Okay, it is a very good sign to say that it's a normal cornea. Can somebody tell me what, what are the findings in this sag sagittal curvature? First, what is the pattern? Asymmetric bow tie with inferior steepening. Okay, then what is the other important? What are these? That is a axis, or this is called as radial axis. Okay, so skewing of the radial axis, inferior stapling, keratoconus. So this is the rest of the picture of the same patient, posterior elevation, thin cornea. Now, I think I'm going overshooting the time. So this is, what do you think about this? This is a sagittal curvature. Is it normal? What is this? This is a symmetric bow tie, which is horizontal. What does it mean? What sort of astigmatism is this? With the rule, against the rule? Against the rule astigmatism. Look at this packy map. How are the thickness? Normal, right? Actually, thicker side. So is it an abnormal cornea? Uh, with this information, I think all of us would say it's a normal cornea. Why? Because the surface topography is normal, thickness is normal, okay. So this is what you get when you're using a placido system. But then, see what happens when you see the curvature. And this is why people are now moving towards the so-called tomography or the systems which incorporate techniques other than just the placido. Look at the curvature. You have a localized island here. Look at this, huge posterior elevation. This is early keratoconus or what we call as subclinical keratoconus. 
What pattern is this? Hmm? Crap claw, right. So where do you see it? PMD or pellucid marginal degeneration. Another example, what is this? Again, crap claw. And again, these are the situation where the tomography helps. What is the kind of thinning? You have a near central thinning. You have a localized thing. Is that what you see in PMD? What is the clinical feature in PMD? You have a perilimbal thinning, but this is a central thinning, so it's a keratoconus. It's not a PMD. Can happen in keratoconus, what is described as probably PMD like keratoconus. Now, next comes the indices. I won't go much into it. These are statistical values. It's different for different machine. You should know your machine well. You know, uh, uh, each has got, you know, lots of information here. You know, thinness local, maximum curvature, anterior chamber, uh, you know, uh, parameters. Uh, then uh, this is a, you know, Bellin Ambrosio, which enhances the curvatures and then change in the corneal thickness. Okay. Uh, this is the 95th percentile, which is a normal range. Anything going outside means the cornea is abnormal. So that is. Next step, there are, you know, each machine has got then, you can play with it, subtraction maps, this is a shame flag image, and things like that. So clinical application is basically in screening in, I mean, refractive cases, then post and po pre and post refractive changes, other diseases, suture manipulation, IOL power calculation, contact lens fitting, and so on and so forth. Lots of things. Now, we'll jump to the OCT. So what does OCT give? Uh, Devendra has given a beautiful uh, outline or basics of OCT, so just to clinical application. Nice picture, right? But then compared to this, what are the differences? The resolution is less in this, but it gives a broad out of view. This is a time domain and this is an SD OCT images. So that is the difference between the OCTs. It's so clear that you can actually see the, what is this, this is the epithelium, Surface tears, epithelium, Bowman's membrane, you know, stroma, even the decimals you can see. That's advantage. Diseases, conjunctival diseases, uses, you can use in the dry eye to assess the tear lake. So, then, chalasis. What is chalasis? Conjunctival chalasis. Redundant fold of conjunctiva. Okay, so this is, this is the clinical picture. Clinically, how you diagnose this, you see them and you can do a fluorescent staining which shows a break up, broken up layer. And this is what the OCT shows, bunched up and after surgical management. So then, pterygium, what you can see is the, this is the normal epithelium on the cornea, which goes on to the surface, slightly hyper uh, reflective and subconjunctival tissue. So slightly hyper reflective because it is important the importance is in differentiating from what? OSSN, I'll come to that later. In recurrent pterygium, it is highly useful in assessing what lies beneath the pterygium, thickness of the cornea. If it is too thin, you may have to be ready with a transplant, okay. Lymphoma, what it shows is that epithelium is normal, lesion is below. OSSN is where we use it maximum in anterior segment. Thick and hyperreflective epithelium, which kind of shows an abru ab abrupt vertical transition from abnormal to normal epithelium. So this is a definite indication of OSSN. Another example, then in, when you're doing a uh, medical therapy, with what do you use for medical therapy in OSSN? Topical interferon alpha or mitomycin C. Third, rarely used, 5-FU, okay. So you can follow up the response, okay. See how thick it is and it reduces and it's practically normalized. That is the advantage of ASOCT. I'm just uh, running through nothing, nothing much. Most of the, except in uh, AS, I mean, uh, OSSN, most of other use of ASOCT in anterior segment is to, you know, kind of substantiate what you see clinically. Pachymetry, epithelial map. See, this is one area, you know, uh, it gives a nice thickness of 369, but if you see the ASOCT, what do you see? This is the tear film and this is the epithelium. 
the whole thickness, including the epithelium, is just 280. So this is this is a case where you cannot do what? Figure out. Okay. See, the stroma is hardly 192. This is a, you know. I don't know why it's not moving. Anyway, thanks. I think I'll stop here. I've overshot time a, a lot. Thanks a lot, madam, for including me. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. And now uh, we have, a, again, a very important topic of HES and diplopia charting. And that will be covered by Dr. Minakshi Swaminathan. She is the director of academics at uh, Shankar Netralia. Are you all hungry? We'll all go to lunch together. What do you say? All right. So if you're shown a HES chart, a diplo diplopia chart in the exam, it usually means you're doing well. Okay? And you've usually been shown all these other charts before that was covered. And so actually feel good about yourself if you're shown a diplopia HES charting. So just a couple of slides about principles. So diplopia and HES charting are subjective methods. They use different ways to induce diplopia. Helpful in assessment of incompetent strabismus. Remember that patient should have an incompetent strabismus and usually acquired, OK? Not necessarily, but usually acquired. So diplopia charting uses a single stimulus to dissociate the eyes. And basically, you record the separation of the diplopic images in the nine cardinal positions of gaze. That's what a typical diplopia chart looks like, OK? Red in front of the right eye by convention, green in front of the left eye. So what do you ask yourself? You're going to ask two questions when you're shown a diplopia chart. Is it crossed or uncrossed diplopia? And the color, the red color, or the green color, is higher or lower? If it, the red color is higher, it means the right eye is higher or lower? Lower. OK? So let's go back to this. Here, is it um, crossed or uncrossed diplopia? Red before the right, remember. In up gaze, is it a crossed or uncrossed diplopia? And remember, this is what the patient is seeing. OK? So without much ado, the, this is cross diplopia. And what is the position of the right eye, the red before the right eye? It's below, so the position is hyper. All right. Remember that? We're going to come back to diplopia charting, and you're going to solve a few ones. OK. It's not usually plotted routinely. You will be asked to do it if you get an a uh, palsy patient to the exam. Cranial nerve palsy in the exam, third nerve, sixth nerve, you will be asked to plot it. So that's where it will be important. Hess chart is based on foveal projection. Harrington's and, Herring's and Sherrington's law of innovation are uh, uh, the principles, and dissociation of the eyes by complementary colors. Again, useful only in incompetence strabismus, the prerequisite that the patient must have normal retinal correspondence and central fixation. And it should not be only used for assessment. You have to have clinical assessment as well. You have to measure the patients in all cases. You have to do ductions inversions and also do a HES chart. It helps in assessing progress over time, helps in planning treatment, and evaluate the results of st surgeries for incompetent strabismus. So let's go stepwise. What are you going to ask if you're given a HES chart? Which is the affected eye? And how do you know that? It's the eye with the smaller field. Second question, is it mechanical or neurogenic? And we're going to see examples of that in a minute. Which are the underacting muscles? Which are the overacting muscles? And then you come together and I say, ha, the, this is the diagnosis. All right, so what's wrong with this? This chart, look at it. It says green before right eye, green before left eye. Clearly, it's, even, it's, it's a wrongly done chart, OK? So if they trick you into this, it means you're uh, ready for the gold medal. Um, so you usually will not get very complicated things in the exam as well. This looks like a complicated chart. You, um, so how do you know if it's a mechanical defect? You have a compressed field with a limited muscle sequelae. Look at that. The field is compressed. Can you see this? And uh, if, how do you know it's neurogenic? Because the smaller field with proportional spacing, muscle sequelae is common. And that is how it looks. You Can you see the inside square and the outside square are fairly parallel everywhere, the distance. So that is typical of a neurogenic defect. Once more, compressed field, mechanical, fairly parallel between the inside and outside circle, 
then it is a neurogenic field. Anybody can tell me quickly, why do we have two, two things there? Why not just have one? Why is there an inside plotting and an outside plotting? Because in very subtle paresis, sometimes the inside will almost look normal. So the outside plot is what will tell you really what is the problem. All right, let's go through some examples. Okay, remember the questions, okay? All right, first one, which is the affected eye? Right eye or the left eye? Right eye, the one with the smaller field. And uh, the next question, do you think it's a neurogenic or it's a mechanical? Fairly parallel, look at that, fairly parallel between eye, inner and outer. So it's a neurogenic field. What is the underacting muscle? What's that? It's the lateral rectus, okay? Overacting is the contralateral medial rectus. So what's the diagnosis? Right, right sixth palsy. Are you warming up or is it uh, hypoglycemia pre-lunch? No, okay. Or is it just head charting? All right, six no palsy, right eye, correct. So let's do another one. It gets, gets a slightly trickier. So which do you think is the affected eye? They look fairly similar, don't they? So probably bilateral. That's possible too, remember. It could be bilateral, whatever you're dealing with. Think it's neurogenic or myogenic? Mechanical. Neurogenic, look at the spacing. It looks almost the same everywhere. See that? Which is the underacting muscle? So we have decided, determined it's bilateral. So which is the underacting muscle? What's the muscle there? Uh, do you see, uh, am I going too fast? So th this, perhaps I'm going too fast. So this is what the normal square should be in a square, and this is what the normal outer square should be. And this is not, is falling short. So what is the muscle here? Superior oblique. And what's the muscle here? Again, superior oblique. So it's a bilateral superior oblique palsy. All right? Okay, one more here. What do you think? It's mechanical? Oh no, first of all, which is the affected eye? Right eye or left eye? The right eye, agree. Do you think it's mechanical or it could be neurogenic? Yeah, it looks maybe neurogenic, maybe mechanical, but it does look a little bit funny compressed here, right? Which is the underacting muscle? Inferior oblique, slightly extending to superior rectus also, but you can tell elevation is limited. And correspondingly, there is overaction here. You see that? So what could be causing elevation limitation in adduction? That is inferior oblique um, direction. What's the diagnosis? Limitation of elevation and adduction. Could be inferior oblique paresis, but a good differential is Brown syndrome. All right? Brown syndrome. All right, next one. Affected eye. What do you think? This is smaller than this. Come on, there are arrows and this is not even complete, okay? So the left eye is the affected eye because it has a smaller field. Neurogenic or mechanical, what do you think? Come on, shut up, neurogenic? How many think it's neurogenic? All right, you're right, absolutely right, neurogenic. Underacting muscle, superior oblique and overacting muscle. It's so the corresponding inferior rectus on the other side, okay? A little bit of inferior oblique overaction as well. You can see this is slightly gone outside, all right? So diagnosis is left, superior oblique palsy, that's right. You can speak up, you're, you're right on the right track. Okay, affected eye, left eye? How many think it's left eye? All right, and neurogenic or mechanical? looks like mechanical, right? It's kind of stretched out, up and down. So what do you think is going on here? Elevation seems to be limited. So the underacting muscle all across elevation is limited. Okay? What do you think? Depression is limited as well. Do you see that? Depression is limited. And you can say corresponding overaction in the other eye. So what is the condition in where you get elevation also limit, limited, depression also limited? Dr. Rashmin is answering everything here. Yes, you're right. What is it? A blowout fracture. Okay, third nerve, there will, the adduction also will be affected. So it's a orbital flow fracture with entrapment 
of the AP reactors in the left eye. Okay, next one. How about this one? You think which is the affected eye? The left eye? And uh, how many think it's neurogenic? How many think it's me uh, mechanical? What do you think? It's neurogenic? Not very clear. Maybe neurogenic. Okay? P pretty parallel though. Okay? What is the underacting muscle? You can see superior rectus may be a little bit inferior oblique also, but superior rectus mostly. So, but most of elevation is affected. Okay? And corresponding overaction on the other side. So what is the condition where you get elevation limitation in one eye? Next, next year, we'll put the strabismus instruction course. It's a monocular elevation deficiency. Monocular elevation deficiency of the left eye, it could be an acquired superior division third nerve palsy as well. All right? OK. Oh, and then your favorite, which is sixth nerve palsy, which we already saw. How do you take this off? Ah, there you go. Okay. Okay, I think we probably have one or two more. What's happening here? Which is the affected eye? Left eye, smaller. Mechanical or neurogenic? It's mechanical, it's kind of stretched on one, one direction, okay? See, look at the space here. Space here between the inner and outer is a lot more, space here is less, so this is mechanical. And which is the underacting uh, muscles? The uh, uh, the lat that is, the abduction is also limited, the adduction is also limited. What could it be? Duane's retraction syndrome, fantastic. Okay, I think there's a the last one here. And um, what about uh, this, which is the affected eye? The right eye. You think this is uh, neurogenic or mechanical? Neurogenic, fairly equal here, maybe a little bit less here, but fairly. And what is the underacting muscle? Here. Yeah. Remember, where the line is falling short, and look at this, this line is supposed to be here, and it's here, so what could this be? Where adduction is primarily affected. Come on. Third nerve palsy, okay? So I'm gonna just wrap up with one last uh, diplopia charting, just to complete. All right, so, we talked about, is this crossed or uncrossed diplopia? Remember, right, red eye, and left, green. Red eye, I'm sorry. Red glasses, and left is green. So, crossed or uncrossed? How many of you here think it's uncrossed? Super, uncrossed. So, what is the position of the right eye? Hypo, how many think it's hypo? Brilliant, because the... It's higher, so the eye position is hypotropic. That's all I have to say. And once more, I uh, invite you to the uh, following uh, conferences at Shankaranitralia Cataract Catalyst in June, the Intraocular Tumor Conference in, to 9th and 11th of July, and the ESO's International Vision Science and Optometry Conference to spread the word to your colleagues. And I thank you so much for your enthusiastic attendance and participation. And I wish you all the very best with your exams. And I thank all the co-instructors. Uh, let's, we, we're gonna break for lunch and you're welcome to join us. And any questions, please do ask us outside. Please feel free to ask us anytime you meet us during the conference. Thank you. <laughs>